Praise the Lord. Well, good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We've been looking at the book of Psalms. When we look at the book of Psalms, it is not like any other book of the Bible. For starters, it is a book that is written from man's perspective to God. So when we're looking at Genesis, Exodus, even Revelation, these are books that give us instruction, doctrine, tell us how to live. But the book of Psalms is the only book that really says, God, this is how I feel it. God, this is what I'm going through. Also, when we look at the book of Psalms, it was written with a primary objective. And that was to have a song book that the Jews could sing around the throne. David began the Levitical choir back there to be sung around the Ark of the Covenant. And he expected it to go on. And as I've said before, we all would want to come to church and sing the same song over and over and over. Why and not? And get repetitions. Plus, we can sing the song Amen and everybody can get happy. It has one word in it. But the thing is, if we sing it over and over and over, the song Amen does not describe everything that we're feeling at, at different stages in our life. Yeah, yeah. So we sing songs like As the Deer, where we draw nigh to God and have that desire, and so forth and so forth. We like variety. We wouldn't want to eat the same thing over and over every single day. We want variety. And when we look at the book of Psalms, it was compiled by three different editors over a period of time, David being the only one we know the name to, and the first one. Now, we've been looking at a certain group of Psalms. Can anyone tell me what the name of that group of Psalms are? The Psalms of Degrees. The Psalms of Degrees, Psalms of Ascent. And they were important because these were the songs that the Jews sang as they traveled to the temple several times a year to make their sacrifices. It's also been believed that it's possible that they also sang it as they approached the temple itself. I think there are 15, 14 songs for 14 steps. I might be a little bit off with my numbers, but the song of degrees, whatever number they are, coincide with the number of steps to that lead up to the temple. So they get to the first step, sing the first song of ascent, and so on and so on. Now let's move on to our song for today, which is Psalm 1, chapter 133. There's only one more song besides this one that we will be looking for the song of the degree. So our series is just about to wrap up. But when we look at the Psalm of Degrees, and in Psalm 133 specifically, we would discover that it is the 14th verse. We would also discover one other thing by looking over the past two chapters. That we are on a roller coaster ride when it comes to length. We go from three verses, I think last week was like 14, and now we're back down to three. It falls into the category of wisdom psalms. What well, are wisdom psalms? Those are those psalms that are similar to writing styles that we would find in like Ecclesiastes, the words of Solomon. Or you'll have simulation, um, similes, anonyms, synonyms. You'll have comparisons, examples. That is wisdom literature. So if we start to do our study on Psalm 133, I'll go ahead and read it. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor are my eyes, I, my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. You read it wrong one. I did. You read Psalm 131. But there were three verses, so I was. <laughs> you're too high. Anybody? Can I tell you 
are from the Old Testament when the temple was dedicated, uh, tabernacle was dedicated, to something that went on in their everyday life. We don't really have any discussion about the Ark of the Covenant, coming <laughs> back to Jerusalem or anything. We say, well, maybe David wrote this when the Ark, we don't have anything. The only thing we really do know to try and throw it in a time span was we do know who the author was. And who is the author of Psalm 133? David. David. So we can kind of place it there at uh, the beginning of Israel, the early years. Because the interesting thing, and I'll throw you another side note. You realize that when you talk to a Jew about the first king of Israel, they're not going to go to Saul, uh, Saul. They go to King David. They consider David the first king. We know historically that Saul was, but in their mind's eye, David was the first one because he really unified the kingdom and spread the borders. So moving on, there is one individual that we can see throughout the entire Bible in every passage we read practically. Because the Bible is all about one person. The Bible declares to us in John chapter 1, I believe it is, that in the beginning was the Word. In verse number 11 or 14, it tells us who the Word was, and that is Jesus Christ. So how can we see or view Jesus Christ in this passage? According to Keith L. Brooks, and I've used him a lot simply because he was just easy to go to. And the reason being was, he stated this, the finest unity is that the that which the saints have in Christ Jesus. Because, and he refers to John 17, 21. If we are in tune with Christ, we will be in tune with all of his. While there may not always be the oneness of you, and we're not talking oneness as in Jesus only, but oneness as a collective whole, one mindset, one core, kind of the same um, mentality we would throw out there for the day of Pentecost. They were all in one mindset and one core. It didn't mean that they had different thoughts or that they thought about things differently, but their minds were in Jesus Christ. Their minds were being on focus. Their minds were on receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, waiting for the comfort, or waiting for the comforter, comforter of the Father. I will slow down and speak clearly. <laughs> but they will be not always the oneness of you, but there can always be the oneness of spirit and object in Christ. When we look at the division of Psalm 133, can we pull out any real divisions in Psalm 133? Historically, I would say no, it's not like uh, we have any indication that David wrote one verse one day and about three days <laughs> later, Brother Eli sat down and said, you know what, they're not going to get this, we need to have an illustration. So then he came down to Aaron, going back to the tabernacle, and while he's there penning it, thinking about about five years later, he goes, you know what, Aaron just did cut it, I don't know if future generations are going to get it, so let's throw out another illustration. We don't have any indication of this, but we can pull out somewhat of a division if we really wanted to. And we've already discussed it a little bit this morning. So if you were to divide Psalm 133, where do you think the break would be? And I agree with you. And all that is is a division of break stating between the main thought and David saying, you know what, we need to shed some light on this. So you have a division between the main thought and then you have illustrations in verses 2 and 3. If we wanted to divide it in any way. When we start talking about Psalm 133, let's start with verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When we start looking at this passage, David didn't want us to wonder what he was talking about. He didn't want to go into a narrative. He wasn't discussing something that happened in history. But he wanted to get straight to the point. You realize that sometimes with people, you can't get around that thing. Sometimes you just got to be blunt. Now, and I'm sure the Jews were just like we are, or some of us. You know, sometimes we get some things, and sometimes we just need to get head over the head with it several times, as clear as possible, because we just can't get the simplest of concepts. We're just having one of those days. And that's exactly what he does. He says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is to uh, dwell with each other in unity. 
There's one thing that should pop out, and no, it's not the one thing we've been talking about through the entire book of Psalms, because we've been discussing the word Lord. But what's the very first word there? Behold. If we were to take that word and we want to put it in our language or our vernacular, however you want to phrase it, what would we translate that to? It's not hard, but what does the word before mean? To look. Yeah. You need to see this! Or open your eyes! This is important. Or if we're in writing and someone's writing an important message to you, they might Put, you know, pay attention to what I'm putting down. You know, read carefully, however you want to phrase it. But David starts off with that word, behold. Behold, the king is coming. That's not quite what he's saying, but yes, pay attention. He's coming. So David what is saying, what I'm writing to you is extremely, extremely important. Pay attention. And he concludes with, how pleasant and how I need to find it. Good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So he's saying, pay attention. This is extremely important. And he's not saying he doesn't get down and he doesn't say that you have to be nice to brother Eli only part of the time. He didn't say that. You only had to uh, be nice to your brothers and your sisters part of the time. And depending on who it is, that can be difficult, depending on what church you're in. And some few times we get people in church that just aren't quite all there. If we're being about, honest. Don't talk about Denny like that. If I don't want to talk to him, I just read it because I don't need to hear me out there. But no, just being realistically. Sometimes we don't get the brightest of people in church. Sometimes we don't get the nicest people in church. Sometimes we don't get the best smelling people in church. The truth of the matter is, we're dealing with people. We really are. But regardless of anything, it's not what's on the outside, but David's saying, we are part of the body of Christ. And because of that, it doesn't matter what they look like, what they smell like, how smart they are, how not smart they are. It doesn't matter if the wheel spinning, but the hamster has been dead for a very, very long time. If, that's my favorite phrase. But the truth of the matter is, if that individual, regardless of anything, whether it's you, whether it's me, whether it's somebody else, if we have asked Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, if we ask him to forgive us of our sins, and we are not sinning anymore. Jesus Christ didn't come to die just for us and for the smart or for those with degrees or for those without degrees or only those that look at this. He came to seek and save everyone that has lost. And David's saying, behold, it doesn't, we're not looking at the outside, but we're looking at the inside. Are we one in Christ? And if we are one in Christ, he doesn't say that we only have to dwell in unity some of the time, but he says, behold, how good. He doesn't say you only have to do it part of the way, but look how good it is to dwell with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he goes on to say, and how pleasant. He doesn't put a measurement on it in any degree. He doesn't try to define it in any way. But what it comes down to is he's getting down to the brass tacks. It doesn't matter if you like them or not, but if they are saved, and the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits, that you are one body in Christ. And regardless of how you feel or look at each other, if you are truly born again, you're of one body. And you need to remember that. And can you imagine if you went around all day and your hand kept slapping your face? That's not very pleasant. Or your butt. Your, your, <laughs> I am not going to back from that one. But if your foot kept kicking your shit or something like that, you know, that's part of the body. Yes, I know. There is no recovery from that one, and there's no editing it out. But the truth of the matter is, your body has to function with each other. 
and may not always do that. I mean, we all trip and we all stumble and we don't see curves. But for the most part, if we're going to make something, our body has to work together. Hands have to reach for this ingredient, the other hand has to do whatever's doing, holding the thing. Our feet have to make sure that they are standing in the proper location and they're not trying to walk halfway across the room. Our legs have to make sure that they're standing upward and not giving out on us that we're falling down while we're at the counter. The whole body has to work in unison. And the mind has to make sure that everything's functioning. And we've all been in that place where we've probably all been trying to do several things at one time. And while we're trying to put salt in the drink over here and sugar in the bowl over here, we get things mixed up. Things don't always go as play because things get crossed. But when it comes to the body of Christ, we all have one purpose. We all have one function. And the body needs to work together. A church body, and when I say a church body, I don't mean... Miracle Revival Church, the Luther Church in Lincoln, separate from the Baptist Church in Lincoln. I'm talking about the body of Jesus Christ. If we're going to be effective in reaching people, if we're going to be effective in ministry, if we're going to be effective in telling people about Jesus Christ, if we're going to be effective with inviting them to church and them actually showing up, it's going to be when they see the body working and functioning together. Because that is when we are the most productive, and that's the way it's meant to be. Jesus Christ is the head, and we all have a role to play. And when brother, brothers and sisters work together in unity, and they are pleasant with one another, it is a sight to see. And when that happens, we can truly step back in the words of David and say, Behold, or look, there is nothing like this. We've probably all heard it throughout our lifetime. Probably especially Brother Dennis in your line of work. There's nothing to work out that works quite like a well-functioning machine. A body of Christ is a body. It is a machine. And when it's working together and it's functioning properly the way it's supposed to be, there is not a thing on this earth that can compare to it because the body of Jesus Christ is not of this world. It is, I don't want to say spiritual, but it is literally out of this world. Because we are not focused on the things of this world. Because if we are part of the body of Christ, our mind and our heart should be somewhere else. Because where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. So David is saying, pay attention. Because when the body of Christ is functioning the way it's supposed to be, there is nothing like it. And men stand back and they marvel. Because there is nothing like it in this world. And they could never duplicate it if they want to. The devil may try, and he may look effective, but there's nothing that is as effective and as well-functioning as the body of Christ working in unison. Just imagine the power that happens when the body of Christ comes together with one mindset and one accord. If we could get everybody to show up to church service with one mindset, with one accord, with their hearts already prepared and plowed, with their minds, that even though it may try to wander, the devil might try to throw something in, that we are determined that our minds are going to stay fixed on Jesus Christ. I can guarantee you we would have a worship service like we've never had before. Because we've come with an anticipation and an expectation to see things move. And we've come in one unison, one mindset, one accord, in unison. At Pentecost, the whole upper room was shaking a change. So much so that the people outside took notice of it. A few chapters later, they wanted to make sure that they had the boldness to go forward in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once again, they came together in prayer, in one mindset, and one accord. Behold how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And the whole place was shaken. There is nothing like the body of Jesus Christ. And if we would all get on one page with one mindset and one accord, there is nothing like it. And there is nothing that can compare to it. If we go down to verse 2, we start getting um, some illustrations and some examples David starts throwing out. In Psalm 133 and verse 2, the Bible states, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garment. 
And we're looking at this. This oil was not just any oil. But God had given special instructions on the preparation, on how it was to be made. This was the anointing oil that was to be used in the daily duties of the tabernacle. And we're not even in the temple yet. We're going all the way to the beginning. David's saying, let me take you back to the very beginning where our Jewish religion began. Because really, God organized the Hebrew religion as we know of it today all the way back in the wilderness. It may not have been well defined with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while they were serving them, but God came when they when the Jew Israelites came out of Egypt, God said, you know what? We're gonna do things and make things a little bit more permanent. And this is the way I want to be done. And he goes back to the day where it all began. Aaron becomes the very first high priest, not for just his family, but for an entire nation. And they anoint him with the anointing oil. The anointing oil, if we would start studying scriptures, and I didn't put it in my notes, but as we study the scriptures, oil is a type of the Holy Ghost, or a symbol of the Holy Ghost. Now, the body of Christ, we cannot do anything without the power of the Holy Ghost. We can try to do things on our own, and we might be a little bit successful, but it only goes so far. But on the day of that Aaron was anointed with oil and declared the high priest, where did the anointing oil land first? On the head. Who's the head of the church? Christ. Christ. The anointing that God has, the anointing that Christ has, flows down from the head. And when we look at Aaron, it's not like when we anoint people with oil to pray over them that because they have a body. What do we do? We put a little dab on our finger and we put it on the head and God bless them. But on this day, there was so much oil that it didn't just put a mark on his head, but it began running down his face and began running down his beard. And as we go on throughout this verse, it said that it went down the scar skirts of his garments. So what does that tell us? It basically flowed down his entire body. We could talk about the beard, but we're not talking about the beard right now, brother. But when we look at Aaron, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. The anointing that he has, and it was a tremendous anointing. What does the Bible state concerning the things that Jesus Christ did? Let's kind of contain it. We could write on and on and on, and we'd end up with carpal tunnel and arthritis before we ever finish writing the things that Jesus did, and we were right there with him. But the anointing that God has flows down over the entire body. It is meant for you, it is meant for I. Doesn't matter what our function is, even if it's to help keep the church balanced because somebody's got to be the little toe. You realize if you lose your little toe or the big toe, you lose your balance and don't quite walk right. But it doesn't matter what your role is in the church. Every role is important. It doesn't matter if you're a neck, arm, hand, whatever. We all need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And the anointing that Christ has is available for every believer. Because it flows down throughout the entire body. And it is what helps us go about our everyday business. Or at least it should be what helps us go about our everyday business. And if the church truly was dwelling together in unity, we would have the mind of Christ. And we may not be every day at the vending machine and say, Lord, do I get a Dr. Pepper today or do I get a Mountain Dew? But rather, Lord, if there's somebody that you want me to witness to today, bring them to me. Let me talk to them. You know, John and I, the apostle of prayer, who died at the age of 37, would pray, Lord, send me one soul to witness today. And then eventually God said, Lord, send me two souls to witness today. You know, are we asking God, Lord, whatever you have for me to do, whether you want me to pray for somebody in Walmart, whether you want me to give somebody some money that they might need, Lord, let me be a blessing today. Because here's the other thing about oil. Do you know what oil was used for in Bible days? It was a healing remedy. They would use it on their cuts, on their bruises. They would use it in burials. When we 
look at oil throughout the Old Testament especially, we see it being used in things that were broken. Look around us. Are there not a lot of broken things out there? Are there not a lot of broken people? How many people can you think of on a daily basis that you come in contact with that might be struggling financially, spiritually, emotionally? But are we willing to step out and lay our hands on the sick? Are we willing to say, you know what, I can't, maybe I can't provide the funds that you need. Or maybe I can't heal that situation. Or maybe, you know what, I've never been in that situation before. But I can take you to somebody who has. And I can take you to someone who has a solution. The problem may not go away, but I can promise you that he'll give you exactly what you need to get through it. When the body is functioning perfectly, having the mind of Christ in you, come to know about God, send me somewhere that I can do something for you. Or let me do something for you today. And that is our mindset, because when that is our true desire, our minds will be fixed on Jesus Christ. We will be fixed on looking to help others. We will be looking, fixed on looking for people that don't know Jesus Christ, that we may point them to him. Because our heart is not in this world. But it's way, way, way on the other side of the universe. They say when you get old to the end of the universe, you'll find complete darkness. I believe it's complete opposite. I think when you get to the end of the universe, you're going to see nothing but pure light. But when the body of church, when the church, the body of Jesus Christ, is dwelling together in unity, and we are working because the body has one purpose. I didn't get up and my foot went one way today and my foot, other foot went somewhere else. But we all came to the same place. It has one purpose. Now as I'm walking, my body has one purpose. It's hopefully functioning in unity. But the church is supposed to be the same way. Just as your body works with you, so should the body, as long as we're dwelling together in unity. We should have that mindset to function with one mindset, power, with one action. God never designed the church to be Baptist, Lutheran, uh, Methodist, whatever you want to put it, labels. It was meant to be the body of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not pushing one world religion because that just scares me to begin with. And I think it's unbiblical because we know it's coming, the end is coming. But at the same time, the body of Christ was meant to be one, un one body, one unit. The Jews were meant to be one body, one unit, but they still had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. What does that tell us? When man gets involved, when we start going our own way or saying, I think it should be done this way, or I should be, I think it should be done that way, the body does not function properly. Because there is not that one mindset. If my mind will be split right now trying to do several different things at one time, it's not going to function properly. And it's, it's going to be impossible to get what I need to be done done. Lord, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Because we are meant to be one functioning body, one unit. If we go down to the last verse, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mount of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So it's just like, as the dew of Hermon, what does dew do? What does dew do? It covers it saturates. It takes over an area. We need to have the anointing oil. But yet, do worse in unison. You don't typically find a patch over here about a mile away. It's got to be over there. Where the dew falls, that's where it falls. And it covers. And when you step foot on the dew, you know that you stepped in something. Because it's wet. There's moisture. But it does more than that, too. It says, it almost has like a trickle-down effect because it covered the mounds of Zion. But dew does not come down just to take over an area. It's not a weed. There's a purpose to it. That dew provides sustenance and nourishment to those plants in that area. When we go to the backyard and we step down and the dew's in it, it's there to provide nourishment to the grass, to the plant life. The body of Jesus Christ needs to be functioning together. 
because we need to make sure that we're providing nourishment to this world. You know, how else are they going to know Jesus Christ? Now, I'm not saying that God does not do remarkable things, because he absolutely does. There are places that Christian, if they go there, they're going to be beheaded. They're going to be killed, whatever it is. And people do go there. But there have been swarms of Muslims coming to Jesus Christ in past years. Not because a prayer, somebody's been telling them about Jesus Christ, because it's difficult sometimes. But because Jesus Christ has been revealing himself to them. But that is the word of the body, is it not? Are we not the light of the world? If we have Jesus Christ in our heart, we can't really be hid, because that light shines forth from us. But guess what? If we struggle and fight with our brother and our sister, that light gets dark. Because guess what's the first thing that people see when they look at you and I? It's not going to be our accomplishments. It's going to be our faults. And too often this gets used as an excuse. I'm not saying that it's not. But you'll hear, huh? why should I go to church? There's nothing full, but full of hypocrites. Why would I go there? All they do is gossip. Like I said, nine times out of ten, I hear that more of it as an excuse than anything else because they are having heart issues. But the other side is, if there are people, that's not even the light of Jesus Christ. If there are even, you know how many bad potatoes it takes to ruin a batch? Just one. You know how many bad potatoes it makes? takes to make that whole bag of 50 pounds just stink and make no one want to buy it? Just one. Because what's the first thing we do when we start picking out fruit and vegetables? We start filling it up, checking it out, and if you feel something nasty coming out of that bag of potatoes, I can guarantee you, you're probably not buying that bag. <laughs> but 99.9% .9 of everybody in here could be in unison. But all it takes is that one person. But what if that one person is you? Who can control that one person? Only you. Only you can control that action. Because even if a brother or sister is truly a brother or sister in Christ, if they come in with a bad attitude and, well, I don't like that person today, guess how many people what it takes to hinder the spirit of, the, of God from moving? Just one. Because the spirit of division is already there working in its midst. It might not be full blown, but he's still there during the service. If somebody comes in doing things that they shouldn't be, and they have a spirit tying along because we know the devil's not on my present, but he can come to church and guess what? You might just give them a ride. All it takes is one person. So we need to make sure that we are constantly checking ourselves. We need to make sure that our mind is constantly on Christ. Because when we have all come, not just 99, but all 100% have come with the same mindset and one accord, not just church, because this is just a meeting place, but we can function as individual units of the church outside of here as well. Because they know where you go to church, they know where I go to church, and when they say, oh, they're doing that way, and they do that, and that person does the same thing, and they're always talking about Jesus, and they're, look, you know, there's a difference. Behold, how pleasant and good it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Not just for the work of God to be done, but because people see that. And we need to be a light to this world. And we need to be something completely different. In a world that brings in sadness and gloom, it seems like it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And when you look at the media, they never cover anything good. It's always just worse and worse and worse. So you can sit down and watch the news, and it's just like, ah! But when the church world works together in unison, imagine what God could do with one sort out church, one functioning properly. And I will end here. <coughs> but in the word of David, just one more time, <coughs> he said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity, because there is nothing like it. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. But Lord, we thank you that your God can reign on high, that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we would worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost could move, making himself visible if we so choose the Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would take away the desires of all our hearts and give us the desires of your heart. <coughs> Anoint the song of the musicians as they praise you upon the straight instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, Lord. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today. And anoint our minds and our hearts, Lord, to receive the word which you have for us, Lord. That it would fall on good soil that we may remember throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives that we would be transformed even farther into the very image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. Huh? If you don't have a home, don't come here and 